Hey, hey, this is Casey Ruff, and welcome to episode 21 of season two. Today, we are speaking with Ben Azadi. Ben is a best-selling author, world-renowned health expert, and host of the fantastic, highly rated, and award-winning podcast, The Keto Camp Podcast. He is a prolific content creator on several platforms and has created hundreds of podcasts and other forms of audio and visual content. Ben was hosted on our primary podcast, so be sure to check out that inspiring and educational conversation on episode 290 of Balanced Body Radio. Ben Azadi, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to the How to Make a Podcast podcast. Casey, I'm grateful to be back with you. I was on your other awesome podcast, Boundless, and now we're back for round two. Absolutely. We are back. I love your show. I've been following your content for a very long time. I'm so excited to deep dive into your experience with podcasting. But before we do, um, you are a world health expert in you know supplements and nutrition and all kinds of stuff. So tell the audience a little bit about vitamin G. Vitamin G. Yes. It's the strongest vitamin in the world, the most potent. There's no other vitamin that could compare to the healing powers of this vitamin. And uh, there was uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, Joe Dispenza, he did brain scans on participants that went through his seminars. And on these brain scans, he would give them vitamin G and he would observe what would happen in their body, in their brain. And he saw 1,200 different, different chemical reactions and processes that went on instantaneously when they were given vitamin G to put the body in a healing anti-inflammatory state. So what vitamin G is, is gratitude. And it is a universal law that whatever you feed energy to expands. And vitamin G is something we want to practice and take every single day. It's free. It's easy to do. But the problem is it's easy not to do as well. And people just kind of rub it off as it's woo-woo and silly. But there's science to back it up. It puts your body in a healing anti-inflammatory state. So vitamin G is very important for every single human being to take every day. And the best part about it, I already said it, it's 100% free. I love that. What are you grateful for today? Grateful that I'm talking to you again, round two, and your energy and enthusiasm and your support of my work. Uh, it's a blessing in my life. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for a beautiful sunny day here in Miami. This, we were just talking about the sunshine and the healing benefits of the sun. So I'm grateful to get out there a little bit later on today and get some sunshine and get the vitamin D up along with the vitamin G as well. <laughs> I love it. That's great, man. Um, I feel like I connect really well with you. And I don't know if this is um, a trait or it's something that's learned. I'm really going to compliment myself here. <laughs> so bear with me. But I, I learned this, I think, in particular when I was in Brazil. So, um, you know, part of the religion that I belong to, uh, we had to go serve like a two year mission somewhere in the world. They ship you off to wherever you don't know, you know, where you're going to go necessarily uh, along the way. You go to a foreign country, generally speaking, and, you know, you know nothing about the, the language. So you have to learn Portuguese for me in Brazil, which is a beautiful language, which I absolutely love. And there was something really interesting that happened with the other. Americans that went down with me, it seemed like most of them got to this point, maybe five or six months in, where they could get around. And that's when their learning Portuguese stopped. Like, so they had this like rudimentary level of language. And, you know, you could order what you wanted at a restaurant, or you could try to get people baptized, and that was fine. And, and I just always felt like I, I wanted to get better. I wanted to learn and learn and learn and learn and keep going a little bit further. And now I'm still, you know, this is 20 years ago. I'm still perfectly fluent. And when I tell people how long it's been since I've been down there, people are like, wow, that's, you have a pretty good accent because I, I wanted to keep on that process. I wanted to keep learning. The same thing happened with me in, in the keto world. When I learned about, you know, ketogenic diets and how they were helping my clients, most of the other trainers just told me I was stupid and it was a fad diet and whatever. And I just said, screw all you guys. This is my life now. This is, I'm going to dedicate every second of my day, my free time, all the books I read, no more music in the car. All of this is going to be dedicated to this one thing. And I want to go seek the very best knowledge in this space and know more about it than anybody else I can find. And I feel like you have that same passion and drive and it really shines through in your podcast. Can you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I love that about you because I feel like I'm the same way. And I, I think it stems from an obsession, right? And that word obsession, uh, a lot of people hear that and they think of it, of it as negative, right? Obsession, you're obsessed. Um, depends on where you're directing that energy, right? If you have that energy directed towards learning keto, learning Portuguese or whatever positive attribute you want to gain, it could be a beautiful thing. I mean, obsession is amazing, your obsessions become your possessions, right? So you learn Portuguese because you were not 
um, you kept pushing yourself outside of the comfort zone or just learning the bare minimum to get by in Brazil. You wanted to go above that. You had an obsession to learn more. With the ketogenic diet, you became obsessed. You saw how it worked and it was really fascinating to you. So when people made comments to you saying it's a fad diet, your conviction, obsession, same thing, was so strong that the other person's conviction just deflected off of you like water off of a duck, right? So I'm the same way. When I see something working, I want to learn more about it. I want to be curious about it. I ask a lot of questions. And that's something a lot of people tell me. You're always asking questions. I always want to learn. And I think that is what we should be doing here on planet Earth. And it doesn't have to be learning about keto or learning about Portuguese, but we should always be learning and growing and expanding because that is also a universal law. Create or disintegrate. Nothing in the world mm. stays the same. I could hold up a cup of water here and it looks still, looks like nothing's happening, but it's moving every single second. Everything is moving either forward or backwards. So you're either progressing or regressing. Nothing stays the same. So I understand that. And I'm like you, I always want to learn. And I feel like the more I learn, the more I need to learn. It's like, oh, I thought that was the truth, but it turns out maybe not so much, or maybe there's some uh, you know, nuances here. Let me find out what those nuances are. And then you start applying things and learning, and it just becomes a very exciting thing and, and a game to me. So that's the way I look at it, as a game to learn more and be curious. Yeah, I love that. That's so well explained. And again, I see so much of that in you and in your podcast, it's just a relentless passion for releasing a lot of episodes and getting a lot of information out there. Before we talk about that, let's update the audience a little bit about your story, how you found the ketogenic diet to begin with, and your story to health. So I was obese for 24 years or so. I followed a standard American diet, which we know it's heavily processed with carbs and sugar and fast food and seed oils. And it was very inflammatory to my body and also to my mental health. So not only was I physically obese, I was mentally obese, mentally bankrupt and suicidal and depressed and going through a really tough time back in 2007, 2008, where I found myself 24 years old, 250 pounds, wanting to give up on life and uh, rock bottom. So I use that rock bottom as actually a platform to bounce out of and, and grow and expand myself. And it started with taking ownership and responsibility. It started with reading books and changing my environment, changing my nutrition, moving my body. And I went through this amazing transformation where I lost 80 pounds. I got rid of 80 pounds of fat, went from 34% body fat down to 6% body fat at that time and completely transformed my physical health and then my mental health as well. And that's what got me started in the health space. Uh, I was still curious because although I was fit, I, I still didn't feel all that healthy. I still had gut issues and acne and other issues going on. So I was exploring different approaches and diets and programs. And I was a vegan for a year and a half, which failed me. And then in 2013, 2014 era, I discovered keto and this ancient healing strategy called ketosis, this metabolic process. Along with studying and discovering keto, I'm not saying I discovered keto, I just started discovering some of the research on my own that was out there at the time. I also started researching intermittent fasting and it was kind of like they were both super fascinating to me. It made sense that our ancestors all did a variation of keto and intermittent fasting. So that's when I went full in into keto and fasting and it made a big difference for my health. I really started to experience what true health felt like and it helped with my productivity and my mental capacity. So I've been studying and teaching keto since 2013. And in 2018 is when I rebranded from Shred Fat, which was my previous company, to Keto Camp, where I niched down and then I started the Keto Camp YouTube channel, the Keto Camp podcast, and everything really grew for me the moment that I actually got clear on my niche and focused heavily on putting my energy into that niche, which is keto. Yeah, that's so interesting. For the listener, if you're not watching this right now, hearing that Ben was once obese will be absolutely shocking. If you could see him, it, this is this is the only lifestyle I've ever found. I've done personal training for 15 years. It's the only lifestyle I've ever found where you can make obese people look like they were never obese a day in their life. Yeah. You must see it all the time. It's amazing. The body, the human body is incredible and way beyond we will ever comprehend and, and be able to study. And it's so adaptable as long as we remove the interference and keto, intermittent fasting, these ancestral uh, ancient healing strategies are ways to remove the interference. And you're right. A lot of people who meet me, 
in the last five, 10 years or so, they're, they're like, there's no way you were obese. Let me see a photo. Is that Photoshop? But that was my life, you know, obese, bullied, picked on. I wore t-shirts inside of swimming pools. Like I was that kid, the fat kid growing up. And if I'm able to go through that and then overcome that and transform my health, anybody could do it really. Yeah. I just think so many people come across keto in some weird forum and somebody says it's a fad when no, you don't realize our current diet situation is a fad. If you go yeah. to a grocery store and a fast food restaurant and a gas station to get your food, that's a fad. That is very new and very bad for all of us. That is true. Yeah. The standard American diet has only been around for 40 plus years or so. Keto, uh, its metabolic process has been around since humans have existed. So what really is the fad? It's not keto. It's the standard American diet. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So the rebranding, that's so interesting that that really transformed your business. When we started Boundless Body Radio, we wanted to have an umbrella big enough that would fit all kinds of different things in health and fitness. So we could talk to a lot of different people about different things. And I don't necessarily know if that was the right move or not. That's just how we decided to do things. You decided to focus on something very specific. Was that always the plan once you rebranded that you were going to make your show very specific that would support the branding of, of you know, the coaching that you offer? Yeah. So when I got, when I got clear on my niche and first of all, how did, how did I even get clear on my niche? I had a coach, a marketing coach at that time. I don't know if you know him. His name was Sean Croxton. He had um, one of the first health podcasts, Underground Wellness. He was like one of the first guys out there before Mark Sisson, before Dave Asprey, before Ben Greenfield. He was like one of the original guys out there with a health podcast. And um, he, I hired him as my coach because he was really good at branding. He's transitioned now to more mindset stuff. But back in the day, that was the guy to go study and listen to his podcast. So he told me, he asked me, what do you, as we were trying to figure out my niche, he asked me, what are you most excited about? Like, what do you find yourself studying all the time, energized to speak about, t t you know, sharing it at dinner parties, et cetera. And it was keto and it was intermittent fasting and still is to this day. So that was what was exciting to me. And I decided that would be my niche. And everything that I do from that point will primarily be based from the niche. However, it was a challenge for me because I love talking about vitamin G. I love talking about sleep and mindset and movement and fitness and other things but I knew I would grow faster if I focused in on the niche, grew a community, grew the podcast, and then I guess start sprinkling in the other stuff, which is exactly what I did. So that's what I did. And it was a challenge to get niched out, if you will, but um, it paid off with the growth. Yeah, it really seems like it. I think it's cool because people are looking for your content. When, when they go to Apple and type in keto, you're going to be one of the top ones that that comes up, there might be bigger ones out there, but you're, you have the name and the branding and all of that. And I think that's a fabulous way to approach that. And it's cool that you use the coaching to be able to set that up consciously. Another thing that really occurs to me, and one of my favorite things to do is always go back and listen to everybody's like first episode. So as I was just walking around outside in the sunshine, I was just listening to your very first episode that you ever did. And when I listened to ours, I, I have a really tough time. <laughs> very cringeworthy. You nailed a lot of stuff from the very beginning. And I would submit that if you released that episode today, there would definitely be differences. But I, I would think, yeah, that's passable as far as like, you got the quality down really, really early. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I appreciate that you listened to the first one. I remember the first one with Dr. Pompa, right? <laughs> it, yeah, it, so it, cool. It was easy. It was easier to record that first episode because he was and is my mentor. So it was like a natural conversation. Um, but I have listened to previous episodes and same thing, you know, like, ah, like, why did I ask that? Or, you know, I sound kind of silly, but, you know, you grow along the way. But, um, you know, when you're competent, you become more confident. And I was really confident and competent with, you know, Dr. Pompa and studying his work and asking the right questions and just being curious and letting go of the ego part makes a big difference. Uh, and maybe I will release that episode again and say, hey, this is episode one. And, you know, we are 400 plus episodes in. If you want to listen to how we started this out, here's, you know, the first episode with Dr. Pompa. So maybe I will do that. That's a good idea. That's a great idea for a bonus episode. Yeah, I would really listen exactly. to it again. It was great. <laughs> That's awesome. I noticed from the very beginning, you, you mentioned something there that I thought was interesting. I noticed from the very beginning, you had the skill of really asking a question and listening. How important is it to allow your guests to speak without talking too much? Yeah, it, it's very important. I mean, I, I've been, before I launched my podcast, 
I had been interviewed several times. So I saw the difference between a, a host who asks the question and kind of interrupts the person and talks a lot versus a host who asks a question and sits back and listens to the answer without having to like wait for the person to stop talking to interject whatever they were thinking and not listening the whole time. So I, want, I wanted to make sure I was a host that listened and I was not interrupting because the episode, if it's not a solo episode, the person's listening to the show for my guests, not, not necessarily for me. They want to know what this person knows. They want to know about their experience, their stories, their research, not necessarily me. So I, I want them to get the full access to my guest. And we could only do that by asking the right questions and studying beforehand. That's something that I do really diligently. We could talk about that, but being really prepared for the episode and then letting my guests share. And I and sometimes guests, I don't know if you have the same thing. Sometimes guests before we hit record, they're like, you know, sometimes I go on tangents or I go a little bit deep, you know, you could just, you know, nudge me to stop. I'm like, no, go for it. Like if you were really passionate about something and you want to go deep, uh, even though I have all these questions, the best interviews I've done don't even get through all the questions. They maybe get three or four when I have 10, because we've gotten so deep into certain topics that we just have a great time. So I like that. I think it's important. Yeah, I totally agree. And I say exactly the same thing. Like you are the guest. <laughs> I'm the host. I might try to guide some things, but this is this is you creating something special and really highlighting your career and all your work. Um, I love that you mentioned the research and that's absolutely on my list of something that I wanted to ask you. It's pretty clear that you do a high amount of research before you interview these people. So tell us a little bit about that process and how you think about that as you're preparing to interview somebody. I, every podcasts I've done. I'm 428 episodes in right now at the time of this conversation with you, Casey. Um, I've researched at least a couple of hours for each uh, guest, sometimes even more. So what I typically do is on Monday, I look at my calendar for the week and let's say I have two or four podcasts scheduled. So I'll block out several hours, Monday and Tuesday to research that person as much as possible. Chances are I've already researched, researched them before, but I would go into like this research mode where I'll put together their bullet points. I'll extract things from their story and their history. And I, I, I think I love it when I ask them a question and they're like, man, you've done your research. I'm like, how did you know that? Yeah. Like, that that's yeah. something I rarely share. Like that's the kind of conversations I wanna have because not only will it make it more impactful for the person I'm interviewing, if they, let's face it, people that we're interviewing on our podcast have gone on so many interviews. I want to stand out. And if I ask questions that are not the same old same questions, it's going to help me stand out. And it's going to increase the likelihood of them sharing the fact they were on my podcast because they're going to remember that one. And if I send them an asset or send them a link, it'll increase the chances of them sharing it because I've made that impactful conversation. The questions, the right questions were asked. It wasn't a generic interview. So I take it very serious. And as all I do is study. <laughs> Either I'm studying for my own content or I'm studying for my guests. But the cool thing about having a podcast, it's, I think every person, I said this, when we, we spoke about this when the Abel James conversation, every, any person who wants to grow their brand, get their message out there, I think they need to have a podcast. You could reach out to people you admire, people you've been studying and send them an email. Maybe you find their email and you're like, hey, I'd love to hop on a 30 minute Zoom or 60 minute Zoom and have a conversation with you. It's a small percentage that they're gonna reply and say, sure, let's do it. But if you say, hey, I have this podcast, I wanna interview you and introduce you to my audience, it'll increase the likelihood of them saying, yeah. So you get to bring them on a conversation, record it, get it out to your audience, develop a relationship with them. And it's all because you have a podcast and it's amazing. And you get to learn from them. They might charge $5,000 for an hour to pick their brain, but you could get them on a Zoom call for an hour for free just because you have a podcast. Absolutely. Yeah, we have found exactly the same thing. The number of yeses we got early on, we had no downloads, we're just getting started, their audio sucks. But Dr. Bill Schindler or Dr. Mark Kukazella, these, these heroes in our field saying, yes, I would love to be on your podcast is so cool. And you get to like talk to these people. It's amazing. And you're creating something that then lives on. And I'm always surprised, you know, even to this day, people go back and download some of those original episodes. And so they're still out helping people. And we talk about this all the time. I think this is so important. And I really want to highlight this. And you mentioned it. You, when you are reaching out to your people, there's one way to reach out and say, Hey, do you want to be on a podcast? And there's another way to say, hello, such and such. I love your work. I love X, Y, Z specific things. This really impacted me. Do you have time that I could host you on my show? 
like treat these people like, you know, humans and ask them kindly and specifically call out certain things that impacted your life, you are much more likely to get a positive response. And you're right. Like, like, I, I, in a very early episode we did with Sean Baker, I reference this all the time. We, we got off the call. The, the interview was okay. It was just okay. And I had realized that I asked all the same questions that I, that he's ever answered about carnivore in his life. And there was nothing unique or special about that interview. He did six of those that day, probably, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I didn't yeah. do enough to make it be fun and engaging and, and separate myself from the others. So I love that approach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've, you know, I've learned that as well myself. And, um, and you've learned too, because you started off this conversation asking me a question about vitamin G, which is not a common question people ask me, especially right off the bat. So that was special, right, right off the bat of this conversation. And something else just to add to what you said. Yeah, that's important. You know, I you email the person, hey, I enjoyed your book. Uh, and you would say their book and what you enjoyed about it. I would love to introduce your work to my audience and make it very easy for them to schedule. So you could either say, in the same email, hey, I have a scheduling link, you know, book at your convenience. If you don't see any times that work for you, let me know and I'll add some more times and you'll add a link or say, if you agree, I'll send you the link, something like that. But having a scheduling link is very, very important. I can't tell you how many times I've been emailed and messaged to get on a podcast and they're like, you just tell me your availability. It's very hard for, for somebody to do that who has an organized schedule. Cause it's like, okay, let me look at my schedule. I think I'm available then. And I type back, I'm available. And that's something that I don't want to do. I, I want it to be efficient. So if you give me a link, like you have done, Casey, I go to the link and I look at it, at it compare it to my calendar. And if I have an open spot then I book it, and then it goes right on my calendar and I don't have to think about it. And I show up like, so have Calendly yeah. some sort of format where they could book with you very easy. I was going to ask, is that what you use is Calendly? I do. Calendly is what I use. Very Dude, easy. What a, what a game changer. I resisted it so hard because I thought I would double book myself or lose control of my schedule. But the way, and you have to get Calendly Pro, I would say. like it, It's worth the investment yes. to be able to set up multiple types of appointments, have buffers in between and after. You can say like, okay, I don't want to book anything within the next seven days. Afterwards, I can book for the next like 45 days. There's so many cool features in there that make scheduling so much easier. Some of the emails back and forth, like you were describing, like trying to get somebody scheduled, they were like 20 emails long. Yeah. And you're trying to figure out time zones and like, okay, next Thursday doesn't work or let's reschedule. All of that is solved by just, oh, here's my calendar. Pick a time, your convenience, so much better. I think that's such a good point. It's a must. But, it really yeah, is. I agree. I agree. I agree. And on the same, you know, kind of note, like I can have somebody book an appointment for a podcast opening or somebody could book a complimentary workout up mm -hmm. by the lake with TRX. And those have different rules and different things. And so I could leave here and go up right by the lake and, and train somebody there. So it, it's, it's cool how you can really customize. It's such a cool tool that people should really take advantage of. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I was going to say, and if you use Zoom to record your podcast, it, it, set, it creates a Zoom link for you too. So you don't have to create a Zoom meeting or anything like that. It's very easy to use. Very easy, automatically generated. Yeah, it's so awesome. What other things, I, I love asking this question. What things did you think were very important when you started your podcast that you no longer think are very important? Huh, that's a good question. What are the things that I thought was important when I started my podcast that I no longer think is important? Well, I mean, I would say 90% of people have the same answer. So I'll be curious to hear what you answer. <laughs> that, that the production needs to be perfect, right? I need to That's have it. the right <laughs> mic. Is that the answer? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That I need to have the right mic and a professional camera and all the right settings and a sound engineer and a podcast notes person. That's great. That will help. And if you could get to that point, great. I'm at that point and I'm, I'm blessed, but that should not hold you back. Perfect should not stop you from getting things done. Um, that's really a form of procrastination. When people say, I'm just a perfectionist and I need to be perfect. Perfectionism is just a fancy word for procrastinator. So it doesn't have to be perfect. All you need is the internet. All you need is Zoom, maybe Calendly. I would recommend Calendly and just record it, record it to your computer, record it to the cloud, and just upload that file. That's it, right? You get started with that, you get some momentum, maybe you get some sponsorship ads and you start to get some income, then you could pay a show notes person or a sound engineer or buy a mic. You could just use the mic from your freaking MacBook or your iPhone, all right? That's fine. It's really the quality of the conversation and your research and you showing up authentic 
that's important, more important than the actual production value of everything else. Now, the production value will add to your growth and add to the progression of your reach, but it shouldn't be something that stops you from getting started or continuing. Yeah, that's very well said. I totally agree. Um, I think I think some of those things get ironed out over time and you need to put in the reps to be able to understand how to do that. So from the very beginning, you were doing all of that yourself. So you were you get buying the equipment, you were recording the calls, you were doing the editing and hosting and all that stuff. That, that's you, you took over that? With my podcast, I waited to start it after I had some things moving for me. And when I say moving for me, I'm not talking about procrastinating. I was focusing on my YouTube channel. And my coach at that time, when we first rebranded and started Keto Camp, he's like, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to focus your attention on growing the YouTube channel? Or do you want to focus your attention on growing the, the podcast, the Keto Camp podcast? And I'm like, let's do both. And he's like, that's going to be very difficult because you don't have the team set up right now. So he's like, choose one. So I chose the YouTube. And that's where I was putting a lot of my energy into. I was doing all the editing. I was setting up all the camera and all that. The YouTube started to grow. That turned into my membership. The members started to grow. You know, I started to get some income. And then about seven months into that, then I was ready to launch the podcast. And I recorded about eight episodes even before the release, had that in the bag. I already had a sound engineer right off the bat just because I had the income from the YouTube channel, but that wouldn't have stopped me. And then I uh, was doing all the notes myself. Didn't have any sponsors. What I was saying, by the way, in the beginning, probably the first 50 episodes before I had any sponsors was um, this episode is sponsored by uh, Purity Coffee. And if you go to ketocampcoffee.com and use the coupon code ketocamp at checkout, you'll get 10% off. They were never a sponsor. That was just my affiliate link, right? So I was just getting some affiliate income. And then I used that money to hire a show notes person. You just kind of grow from there. So that's kind of the way I did it. But um, you know, your, your journey is going to be unique to you. Yeah, interesting. With the show notes themselves, did that save you a tremendous amount of time not doing the notes yourself? Yeah, it does. And I could use the same notes when I upload the video, the video, YouTube video, uh, the podcast interview on my YouTube channel. So I could use that for like SEO purposes and even turn that into like an article. So yeah, it does save me some time. Yeah, interesting. And your notes, if I'm not mistaken, do have timestamps on them. Is that correct? Yeah, every every podcast has timestamps, has all the sponsors, all my guests, uh, social media, website, all that. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So I don't do that. Do you feel like that makes a big difference? I wouldn't say it's like needed and necessary, but it takes a burden off of me. And it, and all the podcasts out there that are like really like oh, the top podcast, they have show notes, right? So I do see it as a valuable asset eventually, maybe something you'd add into the mix, but it's not the most important thing, no. Yeah, gotcha. I, I'm always curious with the show notes. I never get any feedback, so I don't know if anybody reads them, if it's actually helpful, is I'm punching in SEO, like I'm just choosing words that seem to be in the content and like, well, I did, I'm, I'm sending this out into Wonka Vision. It might work, it might not. I don't know. Does anybody see it? I don't know. Let's throw some links in there and, you know, kind of see what happens, but I never get any feedback. So I don't know if it makes a difference or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't get a lot of feedback on it, but I do always reference like, hey, check out the show notes down below. We have timestamps. We have all the links we mentioned we have my guest website their social media down there so i do reference that a lot when i do my recordings yeah awesome and you do work with a lot of affiliates and affiliate links do you notice that by by tagging that in the bottom of the podcast is that driving um you know revenue for you i don't know if by tagging them drives revenue but getting more downloads drives more revenue right so if you have an affiliation with the company um whether it's like a supplement or a coffee or olive oil you could let them know that the episode is sponsored by them, even though it's not an official sponsor. The company's not going to be angry about that. You're promoting them, right? And then you could just put your affiliate link at the bottom with maybe a coupon code and just let them know on the intro or the outro or both. Check the note down below. We put our affiliate link and you could get the coffee with 10% off or the olive oil for a special deal. So yeah, and the more downloads you get, of course, the more people likelihood will click it and purchase. And then that could be another way for you to get re residual income. And then eventually... When you get enough downloads, then you could actually have sponsors on your show, which I do now. And um, you, you don't want to oversaturate your podcast with sponsors, but having one or two per episode could be a good way to make some income too. So that's a really good point. Um, not oversaturating your podcast with ads. And I think yours are some of the easiest to listen to. You record them yourself. You talk about a product. How long are they typically? I listen to my podcast at double the speed. And so I can never really get a good gauge on how long things actually are. Are they about a minute long? 
They're about 90 seconds. Um, 90 seconds. There might be a few in the past that have been two minutes, but yeah, 90 seconds would be it. Um, I moved away from, I used to have one pre-roll, meaning bef- like I would have my intro, what the episode is about, and then have the ad and then go into the interview and then have a mid-roll. So sometime in the middle of the conversation and then no, uh, no post-roll after the conversation. I did get feedback on my um, reviews on uh, key, uh, Apple podcast reviews for the Keto Camp podcast. People saying, uh, not a lot of people, but there were a few, maybe three or four saying, oh, it takes me six or seven or 10 minutes to, for him to get the conversation started because of the ad. So I used that feedback to then change the pre-roll to a mid-roll. So instead of having a pre-roll and a mid-roll, there's two mid-rolls, which breaks the conversation into two different segments. So I, I'm doing that right now. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good strategy. I never fast forward through your ads because they they, they sound interesting and engaging and I appreciate that. I, I came across a podcast today that was like that. It's a big name podcast. I'm doing research for an interview I've got in two days and like literally it's 30 seconds ahead. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The guy's taught all of these products and he's doing like seven or eight commercials for all these different things. And it's like 14 or 15 minutes before I'm even getting into the conversation. Like I, I listened to it because I wanted to do the research, but that's not one I'm going to keep in my normal rotation. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's just, it's, it's annoying. Yeah. Yeah. It is annoying. You don't want to overdo it, but, but, but the, you know, the audience should also understand that it does take energy, money and resources to be consistent with your podcast. So I have no problem with people putting ads on their podcast because it'll help sustain the growth. If you're paying for engineers and sound engineers and podcast notes and assets and all that, that requires money. I mean, I spend uh, almost $2,000 a month just to get my podcast going. I do do three episodes yeah. a week and we create assets. So keep that in mind. But so the sponsors are a way to kind of pay that back and make some additional income, but I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to be like that person you just mentioned where it's just like ad after ad after ad. Two is a good sweet spot for me right now. Yeah, that's good. And, and again, I, I think the way they're placed in the conversation doesn't distract from the conversation. It's just, it, it's in a place where I'm not expecting. It's a little sidebar. I think that's a really good way to approach it. So I really like that. The other thing that I love about your podcast is you always read somebody's review from Apple specifically. So I, I, I love that. Um, why did you decide to start doing that? And has that helped get the message out to more people? Yeah, because as you know, the more reviews you can get, the better it'll trigger the algorithm for people to discover you, for you to rank, and just to make more progress with your podcast. I always say that reviews are like the lifeline for podcasts. So Apple is something that I focus on uh, because I want to rank high on Apple. That's where a lot of people listen to podcasts. I don't even think you could do a review on Spotify. I've never seen, uh, unless that's changed, but I haven't seen any I've never seen that. Yeah. There's like Stitcher and other platforms. So I, I, I do read a podcast, so a pod, uh, review of the day from, you know, Apple user and I'll, I'll say their name. I'll say it's a five-star review. I'll, I'll read it. I'll add a message to what they said, thank them, and then let the audience know, hey, whatever platform you're listening to from right now, like if you could take a minute to pause and leave an honest rating and review, it'll really help. And maybe I'll read your review on the next episode. So that's exciting to them. Sometimes I'll give away a free book too. I'll say, hey, if you, you know, leave me a review and take a screenshot and email it to this email, I'll send you a PDF download or even a signed copy of my book. So I'll sprinkle that in as an incentive for them to leave reviews. And that has driven more reviews than you think if you didn't do that. Yeah, absolutely. It yeah. Has, yeah. Yeah. That's such a non-annoying way to do that as well. I really liked that approach. Um, it's honest. And I think it really plays to, I mean, think of if five people, you know, reviewed your show last week but you're only doing, you know, three episodes a week. We, they, they might not ever get their review read, but they're going to be tuning in just to see if they can hear their own name. Exactly. Yeah. People love that. It's, it's, yeah. I think it's a great idea. Huh? Yeah. 15 minutes of fame, man. We all need it. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I, I do want to go back a little bit and talk about questions that you ask your people. This has evolved for me, uh, weirdly, um, where I used to have, so, so you'll see here, I've got the, um, introduction. So this is what I read to intro. What I do for my notes is I just take this copy and paste that th- these are my notes. 
I'll add some tags and, and that's really about it. I'm pretty minimalist as far as that goes. Um, but typically I'll have that and I'll also have another piece of paper that has potential questions. And these are things that I'm usually dictating on into my phone as I'm out on a walk or something. And since we were doing primarily audio only, it was really easy for me to just look down, see what I'm doing, see which, which questions I had maybe tried to craft in an interesting way. And I would just kind of read from that list if it was appropriate, obviously. You, you're right. You come up with, you know, 15, 20 questions sometimes you're burning through those in you know 30 minutes other times you're you realize like wow I, i'm gonna get through like three of these in this episode this person's talking about which is fine um but as we've been doing more video it's been a little bit harder for me to kind of look down and look like i'm not engaging with the person and so that's really impacted the way i do my interviews and the way i formulate my questions it's a little bit more on the fly or i'll try to take like literally tape the piece of paper on my stupid little tripod that I'm talking into. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you handle, when you're researching people and coming up with questions or topics, how are you handling that? And how are you able to remind yourself during your episodes? Yeah, it's a good question. A very practical question for those doing podcasts. So for me, I have, um, and I have a MacBook and I have my notes tab where I do my, my notes in the actual tab, um, which is the software you have with your Apple computer. So I have the notes tab um, where I put, you know, all the questions I want to ask, all the bullet points, things I want to hit uh, as I accumulate that in there. And then when I hit record, like I am with you right now, I have the Zoom or whatever platform I'm using recording. And then I'm using an ultra wide monitor where I could, you know, push the notes tab to the right, but you don't need that. But I have the notes tab right to my right. So as they're speaking, right, I could just look over and see some of the notes like it's right next to it. So it's similar to what you do with the piece of paper, but it's actual digital on my computer. And that's where I'm kind of getting an idea of where I want to go. And I'm taking notes sometimes. So I'll, I'll put like a section that says notes. And then throughout the interview, if they're saying something that I want to make sure I kind of ask get clarity on or, or get a follow up, I'll like, I'll, I'll type it as they're, you know, I'll look like this. So it kind of looks like I'm looking down and typing, but I'm okay with that. And then I'll go back to the conversation and engage with them. But that's what I do. I have a notes tab on my computer. Yeah, that is really interesting. That's a very selfish question for me. <laughs> I've, from day one, I've done everything just through the phone and through Zoom. And so I'm a little bit limited that way. I think I may need to invest in a better monitor or a laptop or, or something to be able to, to capture those, um, to, to be able to capture the notes and not look distracted while I'm interviewing people. That's a really good, thoughtful way of doing that. Um, I'm curious, since, since you're doing YouTube, you're doing the podcast, you've got so many different mediums and places where you're sharing these things around how has podcasting influenced the way you're you're releasing media in other formats including some of the programs that you offer well uh, you know a lot of ways because i do the video format too so i think it's important if you're recording a podcast make it a video podcast too and you could either use the full interview as a youtube video or you could take clips you've done that take clips from certain uh, segments of the podcast and you could put that as a youtube video or you could format it into a vertical format for like Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, TikTok. So I'm getting a lot of longevity from these episodes where I could distribute it over all the other platforms. It gives me a whole bunch of, bunch of content. I used to do image quotes. Uh, I stopped doing that recently. And I'm focusing solely on Reels and, and short, short form videos with my guests that is performing well for me. So, but you could do image quotes if you want as well. And um, yeah, how that's driving my membership. I mean, I don't really sell my membership paid programs too much on my podcast, but I will send them to like uh, an upcoming keto webinar I'm doing. And the webinar, I'll give a 60 minute education on keto. And then that will be, I'll sell them, you know, into my membership where I would actually coach them and help them and get them plugged into my system. So it's like a step-by-step -step thing, or I'll share, Hey, I have a free keto grocery shopping list that I call the Keto Camp Blueprint. It tells you the right fat to eat, the right carbs to eat, the right proteins and the worst ones, optimal ranges for glucose and ketones. And if you go to ketocampblueprint.com, you can download it for free or get to the, the, click the link in the podcast notes down below. So I'll send them to like a free guide, which builds the email list. So there's several ways you could grow your community with your podcast. Yeah, very interesting. And you chose to do it across many different platforms rather than really just focus on one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You got to meet people where, where they are. And people are on Instagram, they're on Facebook, they're on YouTube, they're on podcast, they're on TikTok. So wherever they are, I'm going to redistribute it. And the cool thing about doing it this way is I'm not recreating new content. I'm taking clips and repurposing it. it gives you longevity. And you could probably save 
all of your, your little clips and, and content pieces you've done in a Google drive and go back two months, like look back at what you posted two months ago and post all that again and post it again every two months. Yeah. And post it. People are not going to remember. They're really not. And if somebody does That's say, right. Hey, you posted that clip with Casey two months ago. I'm going to thank that person for following me so closely that they know exactly what I posted two months ago. But that's not going to happen. Yeah, totally. That's never going to happen. No. Yeah. We need the reminders. Like, you know, like when you were learning this stuff, you had to re-listen to podcasts over and over and over of yeah. other people teaching you these things because it you're, you're swimming upstream in this world. Like we're, we're going against all of the nutritional guidelines and everything that we've been taught to be trainers and nutrition coaches for all this time. So you're kind of more used to that. And, and yeah, people need those reminders all the time especially if your podcast is on that topic repetition something i've been doing too on that um you know what you just said so we release a new episode on my podcast every monday every wednesday every friday it's a lot it's pretty rare that podcast hosts are doing that um that's been part of the growth as well just getting a lot of episodes sometimes there is a wednesday coming up and i don't have an episode it's not done you know so what i will do and I've done this several times, but I don't think anybody has noticed. And even if they do, it's okay. I'll go back to an episode I released a year ago, 16 months ago, eight months ago, and I'll just download the file, re-upload it. And in the notes, I'll say, this is a repeat episode of the episode that aired April, 2021. And then I'll just upload the same exact episode. I'm not doing anything to it. Same episode, same audio. I'll just change the show notes to reflect that it was uploaded before. And that would be a new episode for me, right? And, and, it's, and it's fine. Even if they've heard it before, they maybe forgot or the repetition is important for them. So you could do that if you have a lot of episodes. If you're 100 episodes in, you could go back. Like Dr. Pompa recommendation you just said with episode one. I like that. I'm probably gonna do that for one of my episodes. And I might record an intro for that saying, this is the first episode I've done and I'm gonna re-air it. I think you will enjoy it. But you could go back and repo repost old episodes. I do it all the time. Yeah, that's a really great idea. I will always do that with episodes where I'm featured as the guest. Uh, so all I'll do is film uh, or I'll record an intro. So I'll do a two minute intro where my intro music is playing lasts exactly two minutes. And then I'll do some kind of outro where I tell the audience, like, thank you so much for listening. This is my appearance on the such and such podcast. Please go to Apple. Make sure you leave them a rating and review. They're doing great work. Leave us a review as well. Thank you for listening, blah, blah, blah. And that's the outro. And yeah, that's, that's a bonus episode or, you know, you could, you could like, there's so many, interviews that we did early on when we didn't have a lot of listenership that if I release them now, the, the information is still relevant, but the, 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 you know, audience is completely different at this point and they might not be exposed to that kind of thing. So I, I love how you can be so creative in the podcasting space to do things like that, um, which is fantastic. Um, so I do also want to talk about, I think this is so cool. I think you would still be podcasting if you didn't win any awards, but you just won an award. Can you tell the audience a little bit about that and what that has meant to you? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Casey. It's um, the metabolic health summit, which is a annual conference I do in California along with um, they, they partner with ketogenic.com uh, every year they do this conference and they have a gala where they have different awards like top keto educator, uh, top keto researcher, top keto book. And one of the categories was top keto podcast, right? So we got nominated, the Keto Camp podcast got nominated and there was different rounds for voting. So I would share, and you voted for me several times. So thank you for that. I would share on social media, we've been nominated and we made the final round. And then I got an email from them saying, you know, congratulations, you actually won. Like you were voted the top, you have the most votes for top keto podcast in 2022. So they emailed, they um, mailed me an award uh, which I actually have right here. They they mailed me this uh, keto award, which says top keto podcast, Benazada Keto Camp Podcast 2022, which is super cool. And they announced it at their gala. And, and it's just, it's awesome to receive this. And it's really a testament to my community who voted, including yourself and all my friends and my peers. And, and now I could use this. And you said it in the intro. Uh, you said award-winning podcast, right? Now I could actually say that, which is super cool. So it just adds to the credentials. It's legit. And it's just a cool way for me to get recognized for the consistency with getting three episodes out a week, which takes a lot, as you know, to get podcast episodes Does. even once a week. So uh, I'm really grateful for it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, we have the same cadence. So we release our episodes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Friday as well. It is a lot of work and it does keep you on your toes with all the research you have to do, but it's it's so enriching and such a cool skill. And that award, my friend, is very well earned and very well deserved. Despite the 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 award, all the, you know, all the different reviews that you've gotten, all the downloads you've gotten, what do you what are you the most proud of when it comes to podcasting? Mm. I love I, I love all the people that I've met, all the uh, all the um, doctors and scientists and influencers and people that I've admired and read their books and watched their YouTube videos and listened to other podcasts. So what I what I appreciate the most and what I love the most about it, the po- having a podcast is the relationships I develop with these individuals. Like I've had dinner with people just because of the podcast, and they're I'm gonna be in, they're like I'm gonna be in Miami. Let's have dinner because we had a great conversation. So the relationships that I've developed from interviewing these individuals that I've admired for so many years. That's something special to me. That's awesome. What a great answer. I think so many times I'm like pinching myself thinking like, I cannot believe I'm talking to this person. I have followed this person so closely for so many years. Now we're having a conversation and it's, it really is amazing. And it's, it's, I was just reflecting today, you know, it's, it's so cool to think back on, on a platform that I learned so much more than I learned at school or any other certification was, was podcasting for me. And, and it helped open up the education and knowledge in the space to be able to do what, what I do, similar to you, which is helping people change lives, change their health and follow different advice that people are not getting. And it's so enriching to be able to do that. And that's all through podcasting. So to take even a small part of that is, is so amazing. Ben Azadi, this was a super fun conversation. Always love talking to you. Where can people go to find you and find your podcast? Casey, you're a great host, my friend. You know what you do a good job at? Um, something that I'm working on myself is you'll share something like your thoughts and then you'll you'll pause and see if I want to add to it or see if you'll just go to the next topic or so because um, a lot of the times people don't do that they'll share something and then I'm like oh yeah as the person being interviewed I want to add to that but they'll go so quickly into the next question or the next topic that they don't give me that buffer but you give me the buffer so thank you for that you're a great host <laughs> I could tell you've been doing this for a while um, you're welcome that that has backfired for me before where <laughs> I, I pause and they just look at me and I look at them in like three seconds like no oh, so anyway <laughs> yeah I mean that that's you know then you just keep going right <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't I appreciate the pause um, oh, thank you my keto camp podcast like if you want to see how i'm doing things and get familiar with my guest and and, and it's much more than a keto podcast we do we talk a lot a, about a lot more so keto camp podcast my website is benazadi.com which has everything my youtube tiktok and all that uh, would be the place to find me awesome we will link to all that in the notes benazadi like i said such an honor to be able to talk with you and especially on this topic so fun about podcasting so thank you for everything that you do and thank you for bringing such an educational interview to us today we really appreciate it Thank you, Casey. I had fun.